Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this March meeting of the National Shipper Advisory Committee in Miami, Florida. My name is Dolan Richmond, and I am with the Federal Maritime Commission and serve as the committee's designated federal officer. The National Shipper Advisory Committee is a congressionally authorized federal advisory committee and is subject to Federal Advisory Committee Act requirements. The NSAC members have been meeting yesterday and this morning in their subcommittees. I would like to recognize and thank NSAC member Gabriel Rodriguez and his staff from a customs brokerage, Alexa and Janet, for their assistance and support in organizing this meeting and also the Miami Dade Beacon Council for hosting today's meeting. Before the committee begins their discussions, I would like briefly to go over their agenda for today and make a few announcements for committee members and attendees. Everyone should be aware that this meeting is being live streamed and will be posted on the FMC's website. First, committee members will confirm their choice for NSAC chair and vice chair. Then Commissioner Carl Bensel from the FMC will provide an update on his recent work. Following that, each of the subcommittees will summarize their discussions from the past two days and allow an opportunity for discussion among the whole committee. Following the subcommittee discussions, the committee will open the floor up to comment from the general public. Please note that, meeting, that minutes for this meeting will be taken and published in accordance with the Federal Advisory Committee Act. For the committee members, please use the tent cards to signal when you'd like to speak, and also please speak into the microphone so people can hear you on the, the Zoom. Committee members are reminded that antitrust laws do apply to members in today's discussions. Finally, committee members are reminded that they cannot speak for the committee, the commission, or government and their roles as members outside of the committee structure. They may speak to their personal observations at, as to their committee service and personal opinions on recommendations that the committee adopts. Mr. Chair, I can confirm that there is a quorum of committee members present, so the meeting can begin. And the committee's first item today is to elect and confirm its chair and vice chair. The former NSAC chair, Brian Bumpus, departed the committee last fall. Following his departure, Mr. Simoneus stepped up as vice chair and willingly served as acting chair during an interim period. In early 2023, I reached out to committee members to solicit their interest in serving as chair and vice chair. As the committee is evenly balanced between importers and exporters, the commission desires to have the committee's leadership reflect that balance. Mr. Simoneus indicated that he would be willing to serve as the chair and several of the members who represent importing entities indicated that they would be willing to serve as vice chair. After soliciting the interest from importers, I sent the NSAC members a ballot to select their choices for both NSAC chair and NSAC vice chair. And each member replied directly to me. The individual votes by the members are not made public. But before announcing the final results, does any member wish to change their vote or? If not, then I can confirm that Michael Simoneus has been elected by the NSAC to serve as the group's chair and Kenneth O'Brien has been elected by the NSAC to serve as the group's vice chair. And with that, I will turn it over to both the chair and vice chair to provide some remarks. Good afternoon. I'd like to echo Dylan's appreciation of Gabe and his team and the Miami-Dade Beacon Council for hosting this first meeting of 2023. Um, again, it's an attempt by the NSAC committee to both be in Washington, DC and around the country to meet with regional constituents that we are considering inside the recommendations that we are working on. I'd also like to thank, since our, our last public meeting in Oakland in Q4, the work that everybody on the committee has done, both who were able to make it here in person today and those who are not able to attend but have been continuing to contribute to the three subcommittees and some of the other issues that we're getting into that'll be discussed um, as we go through the day. And lastly, before I hand it over to Ken, I'd like to thank our former chair who's here today, who led us from initiation in October of 21 through end of last year. We appreciate his leadership in terms of us coming together as an organization and 
getting us off on the right foot to this work that we've continued to engage in. And I'll turn it over to Ken. Thank you, Mike. Thank you all for voting for me, whoever did. Whoever didn't, thank you for not voting for me. I appreciate it. Um, nothing really to add. I think, you know, what I would add for, for those in, in the public watching and, and who watch this after, I think, you know, hearing the group today is a bunch of great voices, but there's more voices to be heard. And so I, you will hear this a couple of times, but we'll echo it from the start of the meeting to the end. We need more public engagement to get the, uh, the policies and, and things changed that shippers desire and, and carriers as well. Um, without hearing from people, it never will happen. So we need to more engagement, please. All right. And then the first agenda item is Commissioner Bensel. Uh, hey, Dylan, can you hear me? Is, is it uh, coming in OK? We can. OK, great, great. Uh, I did want to uh, thank uh, Brian Bumpus for his service as the chairman and uh, welcome uh, uh, Michael and Ken. You've got a, a long list of things to do, and I know you're capable and, 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 and you're going to do a great job uh, going forward. So uh, uh, thank you for your service to the ANSAC. And Dylan, a uh, great job. Uh, uh, representing the commission. So uh, uh, I did want to, I, I planned to go down there. Uh, Gabe, I am sorry. Uh, uh, I had uh, some uh, issues related to uh, our, our budgeting authority. And so I uh, really wanted to get down and, and, and visit with folks in Miami uh, and uh, the port of uh, Miami and, and uh, port of Everglades. Um, and so I'll get down there at some point, uh, but apologies again, and thank you uh, for your interest and in, in ha in having me. Um, I wanted to give you sort of a, a short synopsis of where we are procedurally with the Maritime uh, Transportation Data Initiative um, and, uh, and uh, express my uh, continued support uh, to work with the uh, NSACS uh, advisory uh, uh, subcommittee on uh, maritime data and, and transparency. So we'll be, we'll be continuing to uh, reach out and work through uh, issues as we go forward. Uh, right now, I have a report uh, that is in the process of being finalized. Uh, I would like to uh, have a little bit more time to uh, complete uh, comments that I've received from our staff and the FMC. Uh, and I plan to meet with all of our commission commissioners and give them an opportunity uh, to provide input uh, to the report. And then I will be issuing a final report. I will have a letter uh, uh, from me as an individual commissioner with, uh, with a report uh, based on the MTDI. Uh, those, will, uh, though, those will include a final recommendation to establish uh, a maritime transportation data system with certain uh, data elements uh, required uh, uh, going forward. So, uh, I, what I'd like to do is I would like to have the uh, public have an opportunity to review the, the report and the recommendations in detail. So I'm working with the chairman uh, to come up with a process of soliciting a broad, wide ranging um, uh, comment. And I would like to uh, uh, take that opportunity to also work, uh, Gabe, with your subcommittee uh, uh, as we move forward to solicit their comments in response to the report uh, specifically. Um, actually, there was legislation introduced uh, yesterday on uh, some reforms to the Ocean Shipping uh, Reform Act um, by uh, Congressman uh, Johnson and Garamendi uh, and had, had some uh, requirements uh, to, to, to allow us to, or, or to facilitate us moving forward. We've been working with uh, staff. I really appreciate that that legislation uh, includes uh, includes uh, 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 support for uh, moving forward, and it also includes provisions to continue uh, the working relationship that we have with the uh, with your subcommittee, Gabe. Um, so I uh, anticipate in a couple of weeks after I've had uh, uh, opportunity to work uh, with uh, internally at the FMC that we'll be getting a, a process together to allow for some. Uh, comment to this. And so I think that's the next step. Uh, and I know we've been sharing information with you already. So you 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 can uh, uh, take some time internally and and discuss it amongst yourself. Uh, uh, and and, uh, and we'll we'll get back together 
uh, after that. Uh, but I, I was uh, recently in Europe. Uh, I met with the European shipping authorities, both the European Commission um, and uh, big port uh, interests from Antwerp and Rotterdam and the uh, Digital uh, Container Shipping Association uh, to go through uh, conceptually uh, what we're looking at. Uh, the European Commission has started to try to do something in this area on port interface. Uh, they ha they're ha having a similar uh, action. It's, it's uh, much more related to uh, port interface directly as opposed to a system of, of data. Uh, the port of Rotterdam in particular has been uh, struggling uh, trying to get the best information related to its shipping as, as it moves forward and was very interested, as well as Antwerp, uh, uh, about uh, standardizing and, and receiving more uh, transparent information related to the, to the provision of shipping services, containerized shipping services. So uh, I think it's really positive. And then we met with with uh, with the Digital uh, Container Shipping Association to discuss um, uh, uh, track and trace methodology of of establishing a system of in transit visibility for the movement of uh, of international intermodal cargo uh, from beginning to end of delivery, and so uh, that was productive and uh, and uh, and 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 is is leading to this point uh, here where you're having your meeting, so. Uh, I, uh, I really appreciate uh, what you're doing um, uh, in your uh, in the NISAC and uh, and anticipate uh, uh, further discussions. And so, wanted to give you a brief update. Uh, had intended to do that. And I, uh, Dylan, I'm happy to uh, uh, to field questions through you if you uh, if you have have interest. But I am going to uh, turn it back over to you after you get. Uh, Get done to allow your uh, subcommittees to talk internally without uh, without us being present, without me being present. Uh, but uh, but happy happy to take any questions. Mr. Benzel, this is Mike. Um, with respect to the discussions in Europe, you know clearly we've talked with you about who should be the provider of data um, inside of MTDI and MTDS. Is the view aligned in terms of what you're what in the conversations you've had in Europe or not? I mean, is is the EU and the United States looking at this issue from the same perspective, given what we've all gone through, or are they looking at it differently beyond just those two ports? Just in terms of look within the system itself, that's that is the EU. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I'd say we're uh, a step beyond where they are in Europe. Uh, they're very interested, uh, frankly, in what we're what we're proposing and what we're looking at. Uh, so that was meant uh, to be a uh, a, a fact finding, essentially, uh, to share uh, uh, to share information on on both sides, Mike. Uh, and uh, uh, they are looking at a program uh, uh, for port interface. This is basically when vessels come into the port complex, on how they could uh, harmonize that uh, that system. But they uh, don't have a initiative underway. I explained that we are looking at uh, requirements for both imported and exported cargoes. So it would uh, certainly cover uh, shipments uh, uh, de deriving from, from uh, the European and, and, and foreign port complexes. Uh, but they really don't have anything in place uh, that uh, they're considering uh, that is similar or even uh, remotely close to what we're looking at. In essence, we might be the first, uh, the first mover here. All right, I don't believe any of the other committee members have questions. All right, Commissioner Binsel, um, thank you for your it, remarks. Uh, no, I'm, I'm real supportive of your of your uh, subcommittee folks. I know many of you, and you all can reach out anytime you need uh, directly. Uh, so uh, my office is always open to to any of the uh, uh, NSAC membership uh, individually to discuss uh, issues 
as you go forward. And I look forward to uh, to further interactions as as we uh, hopefully uh, get into the public phase of discussion of actual requirements that should be uh, uh, established uh, to create a greater transparency and in information on ocean shipping. So. With that, Dylan, I'll turn it back to you, uh, to your able hands, and, and good luck with the rest of the meeting. All right. Thank you, Commissioner. All right, I believe the data subcommittee will provide an update first. Good afternoon. So the data subcommittee uh, has been working pretty much on a every other week basis. We uh, get together and, uh, and have about an hour meeting uh, each week. Um, since our Q4 meeting, uh, we had our three recommendations that were put forth on uh, container level, shipment level, and air level data uh, alignment. Uh, that received a response from the commission that essentially was um, that as there is the ongoing work of Commissioner Bensel, um, until such time that that, that, that uh, work is publicized and, uh, and uh, made available to the public, um, we will not have a, a, any further you know, response or any further uh, uh, consideration in that. Um, commissioner has indicated that our work is being considered within what he's doing. Um, so on, at the time that that comes out, we'll be able to further develop uh, some commentary on that. In addition, we're working on uh, an additional recommendation to expand on those three recommendations that we set forward uh, uh, in December, essentially relating to aligning the carrier data and their subcontracted parties, such as MTO, rail yards, uh, depots, and, uh, and the like. We understand the, the MTDI currently being in the draft uh, is undergoing review there, as uh, Commissioner Bensel just mentioned. Um, so we'll, we'll advance on, on all three of those points uh, once that, that moves forward. Uh, in addition, we're, we're planning on changing up our uh, committee, uh, the, the manner in which we operate that committee. Um, essentially, at this point, we've been doing a lot of data gathering, uh, discussing those points, and then uh, ultimately leading to the formulation of our recommendation. Uh, what we want to do now is, as those recommendations have been received by the commission, uh, and they are public, is to go ahead and uh, start to publicize that a little bit, uh, educate and, uh, and gather additional feedback from the public. Uh, so we want to make sure that uh, we get out to as many stakeholders as we possibly can, uh, get their feedback and uh, allow that to augment what we're working on. Uh, an, an example would be uh, in, inviting some industries, um, you know, organizations or industry partners to these meetings and um, have the, you know, share the data points that we've, uh, that we've shared in, uh, in our recommendation, uh, gather feedback from them and then adjust uh, moving forward on that. Um, so with that, I wanted to open it up here to the to the committee at large uh, for any feedback on that or any recommendations, uh, any any information that you guys might want to uh, to throw forward on that. Not everybody at once. <laughs> I think just to echo Gabriel's point. Um, Unfortunately, we've got no public commentary on the recommendations and the FMC response on the data subcommittee since December. So to his point, the focus of the conversation yesterday within the subcommittee was really to widen engagement, right? Um, we need, while we have 12 members that are representing importers and 12 members, rep, members that are representing exporters, largest importers in the country, key export verticals in the United States, freight intermediaries like Gabriel, we want to ensure that the view on this data, which I'm going to call the national data framework, is representative of the needs of the, the, the nation shippers. And so instead of getting a pull in, we're going to push out, right? And that will be an, an active program to just, again, get to the point where do we have consensus on these things? If we're talking about at the, at the shipment level, both inbound and outbound, is this core group of data elements, what's necessary for any individual firm, whether it's small to very large, whether it's managed inside or outside the building to do your work effectively. And then look at that at the same thing at the shipment level. And then if we think beyond the port environment, the intermodal dimensions of that information as well. And, and so between now and the Q2 public meeting in DC, this outreach is going to move forward subcommittee is working on a kind of a summary version of what the three recommendations are. So taking those four and a half to five pages and getting it down to 
one document and a visual that Morgan's been working on on our behalf that kind of really conveys it across the physical chain. What are we talking about? So that it's clear and concise, all right? And, it, and then it can either be what people like about it, what's working for them, what may be missing. Because again, what we're trying to do here is create a critical mass on is this the right direction to move forward on as the country? Because our recommendations sit under Commissioner Bensel's MTDI, MTDS initiative, and yet some of them are behavioral. And so they can be worked on immediately. It does not require regulatory enhancement or legislative change. And so we're all tasked with trying to figure out how to make progress in the system. And so, but we don't want to jump ahead and presume our view is completely reflective of the shipper community across the country. So again, for those who are going to see this, um, we will be reaching out to your industry vertical, your industry association, you may be uh, publicly through the various members as we go forward here to try to get to a critical mass and to have comments coming in and in-person um, communication at the next meeting uh, for those who can make it to DC to really go through this. Because from there, we can then figure out what are the next steps you know, on this data while Commissioner Bensel is continuing to do his work and move it forward within the, within the agency itself. Um, first of all, I think that outreach idea is excellent. I think we've all been talking about that on different committees. And just to, to try to understand to some of the avenues there, um, would members of your committee be willing to come and speak to members of other associations and you know show up at events? So, um, okay, that's good to know. We've got a big wine and spirits kind of community event um, in New York in a few weeks, actually at the port. And I think that would be a great opportunity to have someone come talk about this initiative and um, I think those types of, of uh, public discussions, that's where you're gonna get the most interaction too. So look forward to um, uh, participating and bringing your committee in front of some of our uh, Wine and Spirits group. Thank you. If no other discussion from the committee, and I guess we can move into the next item, the fees and surcharges, and we are going to queue up a presentation for this. Test, test, can you hear me? Okay, good. My name is Rich Roach. I am the chair of the fees and surcharges subcommittee, and uh, this will be our report for Q1 uh, 2023. I, uh, this is my one chance to filibuster here. So I, I like to start whenever we talk about demerge and detention uh, to say that uh, we support demerge and detention practices it's just the unreasonable practices or the abuse of diverge and detention is what we are hoping to correct. And so right from the interpretive rule, uh, diverge and detention are valuable charges you know, when they are applied in ways that incentivize cargo interests to move cargo promptly from ports and marine terminals. It's, it's the problems that occur when uh, the cargo cannot be incentivized to move. So just like to put that out there that uh, as we talk about these things, it's, it's uh, it's, it's trying to help make the system better, help improve cargo flow and help keep the costs down. So um, currently uh, all would be aware that there's an NPRM out uh, at the FMC on demerge and detention billing. We've talked quite a lot about this as a subcommittee. And uh, in fact, we've actually put uh, some recommendations forward on these specific topics. But if we look at um, what the FMC is currently contemplating right now, there are some areas where we, we may want to uh, weigh in as a, a total group 
Uh, and, and so I just have listed uh, some of the, the, the more important ones that I think may be or may not be in, incorporated into the DND and PRM. So detention billing is one that uh, if you read some of the um, different of the 184 comments that were submitted to the FMC, uh, there's varying views on on detention billing. There's a section in the um, in the in the NPRM that talks about uh, who should be the billing party, who's the bill to party, who's the billing party, and in the detention billing, there was a dichotomy in terms of you know should it be the contract holder importer or should it be another party uh, like the trucker. So there's some there's some room for discussion there, and we have discussed this internally within the fees and surcharges subcommittee. Early return date, um, we're hoping that that's going to be incorporated in the NPRM, the final rule. Uh, we, we actually put a recommendation to the FMC about that. Uh, it was stated back to us in the response that this uh, rulemaking is going on and potentially there's a, another activity within the FMC going on, which we're somewhat blind to. So um, because that's done behind the scenes and it's a current process going on, we don't actually have visibility to that. Um, I would say that our comments, though, for ERD changes are um, pretty, pretty important, and uh, I'm hoping that the FMC will consider our view on this. Uh, one of the things that uh, is also incorporated into that uh, a final rule we're hoping is uh, that um, there's a statement that, that says if the, and according to ASRA, if the uh, invoice does not include the 13 data elements, for instance, that uh, the charges would not be able to be invoiced. They would be null and void. Um, but there's no actual verbiage about amending those invoices to re-include something that might have been missed, for instance. So that's another area that we've taken a deep dive into in discussions talking about the uh, amended invoices. Customs holds, uh, there's another one that we put a full-blown recommendation on. Uh, we were again told there's ongoing procedure, ongoing uh, NPRM in the works. Uh, so we're hoping that the DND billing will address more formally customs holds. And then uh, the 30, 30, 30 portion of the rulemaking, you know, is another one that uh, may be subject to uh, a deeper dive based on the, the dichotomy of the responses that were received. And so um, we, we uh, have actually approached the FMC with our um, offer to assist in the rulemaking because I think this, this committee has the ability to take a, a deeper dive into those issues. Um, what we were told though, uh, is that uh, if we do want to, as a group, uh, NSAC submit comments on the NPRM based on all of the responses received, that we would be allowed to do that, but it would have to be from the group uh, under a formal vote that would have to be posted with 15 days advance notice in the federal register. And uh, normally like the same way that these meetings are held. And so that would be our process forward if we as a group decide that we wanna take the uh, NPRM any further. So Mike. So with that in mind, is that something that we between now and Q2 want to continue to work on so that it can be actually done within the process or do you want to do it before potentially the next meeting public meeting yeah so i mean there's there's a very uh, limited amount of time to do that anyway i mean we're looking at about uh, five and a half weeks until the next public meeting anyway so that's something that i would throw out to the committee do we have the appetite to take that on as a, a formal um response or a, a suggestion recommendation to the FMC. So that, that's something that we can table for discussion. Let me move on from there though, and we can come back to that point uh, and see if that's something that we wanna go with. Uh, we have a, another topic of um, rail jurisdiction that we put out a recommendation on. Um, this was the opening line of the commission's response and I'll read it. Any expansion of the FMC's jurisdiction must be legislated by Congress. The commission has direct jurisdiction over common carriers, marine terminal operators, ocean transportation and ocean transportation intermediaries. This includes jurisdiction over through transportation. The words there seem to indicate that through bills of lading would be covered under 
FMC authority. Uh, in practice, though, the FMC has not actually taken up their authority on rail storage charges. And in fact, uh, some of the actual documentation that I've gotten back is that uh, because rail operators who are generating those charges are not uh, regulated entities, that they fall outside of the scope of jurisdiction. Those two things don't balance to me. And so this statement versus the statement that you know these are outside because they're not regulated entities, these charges for rail storage, uh, that just doesn't sink. Um, so we've done a deeper dive as a subcommittee into that. Um, we actually, am, I think I'm missing a slide here. So sorry for, hold on a second. Okay, here, here we go. Yep. So I, 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 um, we've done a deeper dive as a subcommittee into this, and we uh, invited Commissioner Dye to our last, uh, actually it was two um, subcommittee meetings ago. Uh, and uh, we went through it with uh, the commissioner about rail jurisdiction and that we, we feel that there's this gray area and you know, where does the commission fall on it? Where does the STB fall on it? Uh, Commissioner Dye recommended that we actually go to the STB and take their pulse on it, find out exactly what, uh, what their pulse is. So we did. Um, we, went, we went to the STB. We um, met with one of the board members, Patrick Fuchs, and two of their advisory council. And basically what they said is that under the Staggers Act, uh, that they do not have authority over any kind of contract carriage. So they do have authority over rail common carriage, but when it moves into contract carriage, they no longer have authority. So, and then secondly, there's another uh, statute that calls out intermodal moves for containers where the STB also does not have authority. So they cited two different regulations where uh, STB does not have authority over these uh, containers. Um, they did say there's uh, been some exception made um, with the uh, warehouseman's case that might be similar to the case that we're trying to bring to them. However, um, you know, the, the uh, feeling in the room was that uh, the railroads would vehemently oppose any kind of um, change in jurisdiction with the STB. Um, so I, I am missing a slide, unfortunately. I, I did have a, a different one up here. Um, that didn't make it to the final cut. So I'm sorry about that. Um, but uh, let me just get out of here. So it, it kind of brings us to this, this quagmire, this, this gray area, this lack of regulatory um, coverage of rail storage and, and what that would actually look like. Um, where, where can we, uh, as a group, go from here is the question we keep asking, where can we get regulatory control? Um, so, pardon me for a second, back up here. Um, so the three areas that we uh, came up with as possible next steps is uh, one, we could follow the warehouseman's case and ask the Secretary of Transportation to have the STB commence an investigation. Uh, we, we, we think that that would probably be a very heavy lift based on the feedback that we got from STB themselves, but that's, that's one possible direction. Uh, we could, um, as the FMC stated to us, it would take an act of Congress to increase the jurisdiction of the um, FMC, we could uh, go to Congress and ask them for that increase in jurisdiction. Um, and thirdly, we might ask for a rulemaking uh, that rail operators must invoice ocean carriers for storage directly, not their importer. So what we've identified is that the railroads are billing the final customer, but the railroads do not even have within their um, the tariffs, or the, the, the railroads don't even have the, the direct communication line to that customer. They don't even know who that customer is. The ocean carrier puts that 
part of their tariff in there saying subject to underlying tariffs with their agent, which is the railroad. So we have this, this bit of a, a, a quagmire that the rail is billing for uh, their storage charges to the general public, which is uh, arm's length transaction customers that they don't even know. And there's no regulatory authority to go back and challenge what the actual charges are. And when we go back to the FMC, they don't seem to have that authority. Um, and when we go to the ocean carriers, we don't even we don't have the ability to look up the rail tariffs within the ocean carriers tariffs. So we're we're stuck. We're we're looking for another way out. And so a rulemaking that says that the uh, the rail operators must build the ocean carriers would squarely put this back potentially in the hands of the FMC. Yep. They're, the customer is, you know, we're their customer, but we're not the rails customer. So it would give us more of a direct path. Um, so th that's just uh, another thing that I, I throw out to the room. We're going to continue to study this as a subcommittee, and we're going to um, work with the general counsel's office as we uh, continue going towards the next meeting to see just, you know, where we can be effective here in, in uh, helping along uh, a further definition of this. Uh, so with that, um, we've, we've actually asked for a meeting with the general counsel just prior to the next meeting. Uh, we've thrown up there that these are some of the, the uh, issues, rail storage interaction between the FMC and NSAC and future topics that we might want to address. Uh, we need to have maybe a little bit more guidance. It's come up time and time again in our meetings that we, we have a, an issue with where to go, how far to proceed, and, and what to do with the uh, recommendations, because we don't want to, we, we don't have, as Ken would say, the guardrails. We don't know the parameters within which the FMC would like us to be advising. And so hopefully this, this meeting would help us further develop that and see where we can go with it. So with that, I'll just say, I'll, I'll thank you. If there's any specific questions from the general group, I would like to answer those. <clears throat> Going back to your second to last slide on the three possible ways to move forward, would the can three exist without two, as it stands today? So can you can we could you execute option three potentially without a change in jurisdiction from Congress? I do believe that we could, um, if we if we got a rulemaking that the FMC was willing to go along with number three, that said that ocean carriers could. Uh, you know, or ocean, ocean carriers must be the conduit that rail operators must bill for rail storage back to the ocean carrier who they act as agent for. Uh, I believe that's a possible standalone solution. Um, is the FMC willing to take that up? I don't know. We would have to put that forward. Um, or does it take an act of Congress? Is it a jurisdictional matter? So, you know, we're not attorneys, but um, we, we want to understand a little bit more about, you know, where those guardrails are. I think Mike, Mike, microphone. Well, I think just for the people in the room and that, that are, will watch this, um, that are not as close to this issue, where does it kind of get gray in terms of clear authority and no authority or no perceived authority? Just so, just so it's, it's, you can kind of, we can get all on the same level playing level on understanding relative to the subcommittee because I think this is extremely important because this predates the last two years and this is not something that just came up as a consequence of what we've just lived through this has been an ongoing area that is apparently in a, in a, in a jurisdictional gap between two agencies mm -hmm. and, and so, so where from where so back to Ken's comment on guardrails where is the perceived jurisdiction by FMC today and where is it potentially gray with respect to both through moves and uh, CY moves on the rail side? And, and that remains the question, right? Because we have five commissioners who can have different views on it. And when we hear some of the views, we hear there's a difference. Um, we're, we're not sure the actual definition. And we, we don't have you know, anything that tells us for sure that uh, the FMC fully has this. There's been a lot of public commentary that they do by themselves, by the commissioners. Go ahead. So Rich, uh, first and foremost, I wanna thank you for welcoming me to your subcommittee, right? I've not been part of it, but in my new role as vice chair, I got to sit in 
Um, and I'd like to voice my support that we do answer um, the NPRM as a group. I think what I took away from our meeting yesterday is how complex the issues are. And that I think even with some, some really great conversation for every piece of the argument that someone made a very valid point, there's an equally valid point they hadn't thought of. And so I think that deliberation that we do would be wasted to sit in that room. I think, frankly, it should be codified into some, some feedback that the general public can read and that the FMC can enjoy as they go down their path. Uh, I think that's important. Second, I think on the rail, your, your point on rail, um, this is the most vexing issue that we've talked about. Two regulatory agencies that can't regulate something. And I think as I listen to your, your four, your options, I would come up with a fourth, which hopefully as this gets, it makes its way to the internet. Um, I think the railroads could start to address this more quickly, right? We are their customers. And I think everyone around this table who represents freight and shippers, we, we're your customers because we pay your bill. You bill us today, so I guess I'm your customer by, by osmosis. Um, and so I, I think I, I, I would make a call to the class one railroads to, to start answering us as customers. In the meantime, I think we should pursue every option we can to find a way to change the law or the regulations to fix this, because there's no reason for it to exist over time. Right. And I would further add to that, that changing the law, what does that effectively do? And what it effectively does is it incorporates the incentive principle that we started with back into the rail storage billing, which doesn't exist today. We should have the, we should be able to lean on the incentive principle for rail storage. And we don't, and we can't, and we don't have a referee in the game. Yeah, and, and we actually did make a recommendation on Dwell formally and did get a response on that. Uh, the response was that uh, Dwell should follow the interpretive rule, which is what you'd expect the FMC to say. Um, and that, um, you know, if you had a, a case that uh, the suggestion would be to, to bring a case, um, if you do have Dwell issues, particularly out there on the West Coast, the, the Dwell charge is charged to you out there, um, that you, you should bring the case. You know, try to work it out, of course, with the biller. But uh, after that, you know, you can you can bring that to the FMC. But that's that's already been a recommendation. Noted. And have you seen, or has anybody on the committee seen um, resolution through that current um, avenue when it is brought up from a dwell perspective? Uh, I know we're missing some of the committee members that may have actually had that experience. I'm not sure if they have or not. Okay. Uh, but uh, that that I can't answer that question. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Mr. Connor. Yep. Uh, I really want to congratulate you, Rich, for taking the, uh, the effort to have the conversation with the STB. And albeit we still have some more steps to take, the fact that you were able to get the STB to say, this is not our responsibility and even provide uh, some uh, judicial or uh, regulatory examples of why they don't have the authority is a huge step because part of the problem has historically been over the years, we would go to the FMC and they would say that it's not their job. We go to the STB, they would say that it was not their job and we'd be in the middle trying to sort things out. So I think that's a huge step that the STB has said, this is not ours. So I think we've got one lane to pursue now, and it's easier to try to solve an issue with one lane than two. Uh, I would just add one other thing though. In the last, at least within the last year, maybe even less, three of the five members of the commission have publicly stated that they do have authority over international intermodal uh, to the rails, with the rails. So, I mean, I, I think that's another, another door that opened. So we should take advantage of that. And last but not least, I mean, your recommendation that the railroad should be billing the shipping line is 100% spot on because in the contract, 
the shipping line is the customer with the railroad, not the importer or the exporter. So logic says you, you bill your customer, right? So, I mean, I think we made a lot of progress in this last quarter, you know, clearing some things out of the way so that maybe in the next quarter we can get some real action. Thank you, Bob. Other comments from the room? Circling back on the 30-30-30 conversation. So again, I think for those not as familiar with it, you want to give a little bit more of an overview of the aim of that as far as the agency is concerned, and then open it up to discussion with everybody on is this is there is, is five weeks enough time to do an effective job to, to review and provide or not right or right. do we need to set this course into the future beyond that but again rec being cognizant of the fact that the rule making is underway and we do if we want to provide feedback it has to be within some reasonable time that people can commit to it sure and this this has come under it's basically a mention within our subcommittee but uh, if you read the commentaries, you'll, you'll see some of the deeper dives that have already been done. Uh, it's so it's not a heavy lift to, to kind of come up with, um, you know, a, more of a, a summary in which way, you know, we would recommend as a group. Um, 30, 30, 30 is that uh, invoices for demerge and detention would need to be billed within 30 days. If there's a dispute, the receiver would need to dispute within 30 days. And then the last 30 is the tricky part. Um, there's 30 days for resolution. And what happens following resolution is where there may be some uh, lack of clarity um, or, or uh, definition that the FMC may need some uh, further uh, commentary on. Um, so, you know, does it immediately go to a charge complaint? Does it, uh, if the parties are willing to extend their dialogue because they're having meaningful dialogue back and forth, by extension, can can the uh, thirty days be extended you know, mutually? Those kinds of things are are not necessarily um, fully uh, understood, and and there's a, a gray area there that I think we might be able to weigh in on. Any follow up on that, Mike? Okay. Anybody else? Well, thank you for your time today. You ready? All right. Well, thank you, everyone. I'm Steve Schultz, and uh, I'm uh, the committee chair, I guess, for the subcommittee chair for the uh, chassis subcommittee. Uh, the update today will be short and sweet as I am keeping us from public comment. And uh, I will say that in the last thir last 90 days, we've had limited engagement as we've been uh, actively working in other subcommittees as a majority of the new subcommittee are part of the other two who have ongoing work. Uh, additionally, there is ongoing litigation related to chassis uh, that has been uh, uh, pending that will impact some of the prior work that we had been looking at uh, and uh, some of the work that we had started with, uh, prior to with uh, meeting with uh, various chassis providers, harbor trucking and other associations. And so in doing so, we've had to pause, uh, reframe and understand specifically what our phasing will look like to understand uh, more holistically what chassis uh, fairness looks like given the national system and the disparity amongst uh, the various port and inland rail system, inland systems. And so uh, what we are proposing moving forward is that uh, in the next couple of weeks, we will start up again with our chassis subcommittee and we will be calling class one rails from the East Coast and class one rail from the West Coast to uh, gather more information on chassis impacts on, on inland uh, inland uh, moves. And so uh, until then, we will have an update on our next chassis committee and or I should say at the next meeting. And I'll leave it short and sweet and then open it up to other questions from the additional members. And lastly, I will say thank you to all of the members who showed up today and continue to make an effort to contribute to this committee uh, as part of your additional responsibilities back home. Additional feedback or questions? Short and sweet. 
All right, so at this point, we will open up the meeting to public comment. Before the public comment, I will note that the public is always welcome to comment to the NSAC via email at nsac at fmc.gov. I can report that no public comment was received via email in advance of today's meeting. For anyone in person that would like to provide comment, please provide your name and affiliation before beginning your comments. And then Uh, thank you, Dylan, and thank you, Dylan, and thank you all for coming to Miami. Um, it's great to see some of you that we met. Oh, by the way, my name is Eric Olofsson. I'm the Director of Global Trade and Cargo Development at Port Miami. Um, it's a pleasure to have you all here in Miami. Thank you. It was great meeting many of you. We share a lot of common goals, and we share a lot of common problems. And so um, I would like to mention... Um, two items. And, and and first of all, I want to recognize my team, Sebastian Yavar and Eduardo Quadra, who are both with the Port of Miami. Um, we are building two inland ports in the Port of Miami and with the Port of Miami here in Florida. They'll be Florida's first inland ports. And we expect a lot of you all um, to be users of that inland port. Um, Georgia has two, South Carolina has two, Virginia has two, California has scores of inland ports. And we think that the third largest state right now uh, with the fast growing nature of, of our population, we'll need an inland port. So part of the what we think about as ports is that once it leaves the port, it left the port and we don't care about it anymore. Especially now with ports operating inland ports, that information now becomes critical because if it's a perishables, which have gone up 58% since 2018 uh, here at the Port of Miami and it gets lost somewhere in the hinterland, that's $10,000 worth of um, value that it loses every day that it's not on a store shelf. So it's very important for us to follow it um, through the ports beyond. Um, also, when it's leaving, we do 50% of our, our um, business right now is with um, uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, which is very important. Um, uh, we're, we're balanced 48% exports, 52% um, imports. Uh, and a lot of that is due to our Latin trade. So I think those are issues that we'd like to work with you on. Um, I wanted to, to give Dylan for the record, um, Port Miami has uh, joined the supply chain information highway. It was an initiative that started out um, with the port of Long Beach and now the ports of Wanini, Seattle, Tacoma, Miami, South Carolina, and New York have all joined together. And, 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 and I'll just read what the, what the purpose of it, the supply chain information highway will support our supply chain partners by providing access to data to help them better plan, schedule, and track cargo movement across multiple modes of transportation. The information highway will provide the infrastructure on which authorized users can assess data and customize it to their own goods movement needs, thus offering optimal flexibility across a wide and very varied supply chain. So I would like to offer the resources of this group, putting it together. Um, we're not picking a technology, but we are working together. Like what are the five most important things that we think that, that we, we're gonna need to know? Right now, if a ship decides not to call in the Port of Miami, we don't find out about it until um, we find the cargo was put on rail in Savannah and, and, and shipped down here. So um, that doesn't happen in the aviation industry. Um, it shouldn't happen in the, in the maritime industry. Um, I like to, I'll, I'll give a kudos to Com, uh, Commissioner Benzel. He met with this group and he, he said that you actually get more information. You can track a pizza from delivery, order, oven, delivery, and to ultimate, you know, uh, payment um, better than you can a container that has half a million dollars worth of cargo in it. And I think we can all, and, and, and yes, it is possible to find out where your container is or where the ocean is, but you know, we've been talking to some of our folks, it takes about 20 website visits to get it all together. So we want to just let you know that those ports that we, I've just mentioned, we're willing to work with you, um, either virtually or come to your next meeting. Um, I'll give you Dylan, the, uh, the, the information on, on the information highway, but we think that, you know, ports are a critical um, uh, uh, delivery point. 
Um, and we need to know better the transparency to better plan, to better know how much cargo is going to put on rail versus um, going out by truck and, um, and also going to our inland ports. In fact, it was so important about the inland ports. We actually invited and uh, as a member is the Utah inland port. So we're looking at cargo 360 degrees, not just at the ports, um, but as it goes through the nation. So I'm so glad you guys came here. I'm so glad you visited the Port of Miami. And I just want to let you know that we are your willing partners and will be a resource to any one of you at any time and the group as well. Thank you. Thank you. And I also want to, for the folks online, members of the public online, you are also welcome to provide comment in this meeting. Just raise your hand on the Zoom and we will make sure that we will beam you in. So, any other in person comments? Uh, my name is Brian Bumpus. Most of the folks in this room uh, know me already. Um, I wanted to go back to the rail um, demerge initiative. I'm sorry. Oh, current affiliation. I'm vice president of logistics for the allied group of companies. Um, all right. So on the rail demerge recommendation that we pushed through, this is a huge issue that shippers face. It was a tangible, what we consider to be a fairly easy fix, which is why we prioritize that as the first recommendation, not just out of that subcommittee, but out of the committee at large. Um, from a shipper's perspective now, um, you know, the optics of this issue um, and the, the lack of acceptance of jurisdiction between the STB and the FMC gives the appearance of a bureaucratic game dodgeball where the ball is accountability. I'm not saying that's what it is, but that's what the optics to a shipper you know, sort of looks like, right? This is a serious issue. This has been going on for well over a year now, just with the recommendation from this committee alone. Um, the FMC, so, so I kind of want to break this down, you know, logically. Um, and before I, I do that, I, I do want to say also that shippers do expect productive oversight from the government entities that you know, represent our interests, both as companies and private citizens. Um, these agencies have a fiduciary responsibility to ensure that, that oversight is accurate, that it's comprehensive, and that it's equitable, so that companies can play, you know, both carriers, railroads, and shippers can play in an equitable sandbox together. So I want to kind of break this down. Um, in the recommendation response, the FMC did acquiesce. They have jurisdiction over through bills of lading. Rail invoices for demerge reference container numbers, which tie back to a bill of lading, as we all know. Without that bill of lading, there is no shipment because there's no container, there's no invoice, there's no reference that ties up anything back. So by default, consequen uh, consequentially and, and logically, then the demurrage is the immediately tied back to the bill of lading, which the FMC has already acquiesced that they have jurisdiction over. So I, I guess I'm wondering what the FMC is doing proactively. So I guess this question is for you, Dylan. What is the timeline here on getting a resolution in place to solve this problem and fill this gap that's super required by shippers. Um, and in the event, Rich, I saw on your slide, kind of going to Congress to ask for a jurisdiction expansion for the FMC, what does that timeline look like? And do you even have a path through the bylaws of this committee to be able to go to Congress to request that? So that's it. Thank you, Brian. I'll just take a second here. My name is John Dom, and I'm here mostly as a citizen, but also as a member of the um, uh, Freight Transportation Advisory Committees of the Miami-Dade uh, TPO, the Broward MPO, and the chairman of the Florida Freight Advisory Committee to the Florida Department of Transportation. We're all looking very closely at intermodal ports. Uh, that is basically intermodal logistics centers, what we used to call inland ports. Now we're trying to connect them more multimodally to various ports uh, around Florida. Florida is a little bit unique. As you know, it's got 15 seaports. Most other places have one, maybe two. Uh, the DOT is a very valuable resource for you. And when you're looking at places to and uh, people to consider as shareholders, I would strongly suggest asking the state departments of transportation and their various districts. Most of them are looking into this right now, as Eric mentioned so uh, well there. Uh, Georgia's got uh, one major seaport. Uh, they got four very, fairly substantial inland ports uh, in terms of use, uh, especially by, by rail, but not so much by trucks. Uh, what we're looking at now in Florida is places maybe north, south, and central, and it's probably something worth looking at all over the country. 
But again, most departments of transportation in the various states have used this. Uh, the uh, Secretary Buttigieg told us on a call about six weeks ago that the federal government would provide funding for truck parking in most states around areas, around ports, especially around inland ports. So when you start to combine the truck parking with the issues that are created by the demurrage, uh, et cetera, that would be uh, chassis storage, it'd be rail storage, it'd be truck parking, and there's a number of different things that can be done on this. And we might solve multiple problems with one thing. So thank you for your help and, and your attention to all this. And I don't believe there's anyone from online who is going to comment today. So with that, I will turn it back over to uh, the chair and vice chair for any closing remarks they may have. So I think just to summarize in terms of the focus, um, you know, over the last year, we, we spent a lot of time as subcommittees and put recommendations for us to the agency um, that were very technically focused and inside the scope of uh, what we believe to be jurisdiction um, based on legislative guidance to the agency. As we as we talked about, Gabriel did here, and I think even with what Rich and his team have done on fees and surcharges, we put forth very precise recommendations. And I think the challenge that we've had in the subsequent months uh, in between the public meetings is that there's been a lack of feedback from the nation's shippers um, on these basic table stake starts to these conversations. We can't move forward unless we can get general agreement on, again, what is being recommended is representative of the needs of the nation's shippers. And so as we look forward beyond today's meeting, you know, I would characterize what we're going to be doing is really an expanded engagement and consensus building. The government holds proposal that went forward to the FMC was very precise, right? It did not get a response because it's sitting inside of an existing rulemaking, but from the shipper community standpoint, is it equitable? Is it fair? Is it reasonable to all sides involved as a starting point? What do you like about it? What do you don't like about it? These are the kinds of things we need to get to. Otherwise, we're gonna to continue to talk about the same things year on year on year, regardless of change in legislation or up enhanced rules, because it's the people that we work with in the supply chain need to hear from us as shippers on what is important to us beyond this time period, because many of the things that we've dealt with were pre-existing conditions, right? And behaviors, that were exacerbated by the last two years. And so we're gonna be very focused on this engagement. And again, feedback on these recommendations is what we're looking for. We, although we believe we've got very good representation across the nation, geographies, cargo flows, we're not, we don't believe we're speaking for everybody holistically and exclusively. And we wanna make sure that we, if there are things that we have recommended that are not clear, that don't completely meet your need, that we've somehow missed something, we're open to making modifications because then from a procedural standpoint, we just modify the recommendation to go back to the agency. I think beyond that, then, if there's a consensus around government holds and those charges associated with it or some of these data elements, we can start to think about what does behavioral change look like because it doesn't all need to be regulatory and legislative enhancements or, or changes. There can be things that can be done regionally with Port of Miami, with some other location, with an inland location, with a specific class one, to get inside of what we're talking about to prove that what we believe will lead to a benefit will or won't by actually putting something into place. And so with consensus on a particular set, right, whether it's the data, which I'm gonna call the national data framework from now on, or something else, we can start to look at some pilots inside of this stuff too. Because again, to change the whole system, a dimension of the whole system at one time is pretty scary for everybody involved, right? The status quo is easier to maintain, but the status quo is not working for everybody in the system. And again, as we, as Alice and I were on a panel at the TPM talking about, you know, OSRA and D&D, &D, one of the points we wanted to try to continue to convey, there's a lot of big organizations that are represented on NSAC. 
There are some small, medium-sized organizations as well. We are working on behalf of everybody. And the small, medium-sized firm doesn't have the resources to deal with the complexity that we've got today. And so we've got to figure out ways to make both behavioral and structural improvements in the system that allow the system to work better for everybody. That's why we're here as volunteers. And so since we're not hearing from you, we're now gonna be coming to you and getting this in front of you because we need to get to a point where we've got clarity on the way forward because then we can start to think about with clarity on the way forward, what are the options and what can we do about it? Um, maybe just one thought to think uh, as, we, as we wrap today. Um, first and foremost, I wanna thank everyone on the committee um, for volunteering their time and for their companies to let us each volunteer our time. I think that's, that's a big thing. You know, it's easy to become frustrated, I think, as, as, as business people working inside a government structured uh, committee. It's complicated. It takes longer than it should. And, and I think there's been points where I've, I've, I've struggled. And I was, I was reading a book the other day about uh, the great Lou Holtz football coach. And he said, when all was said and done, more was said than done. And I think it's easy to feel that way. But I think it's meaningful work. And I think echoing what I heard Mike just say, um, if we think this system will change, just cause it won't. And so I think all the work we're doing is fantastic. And, and I think we should all pat ourselves on the back for doing that, you know, making the effort. But I do think this will take a much bigger group than just the people around this table as, as, as smart and dedicated to the cause as we are here. Um, and so however we can each do that in our own networks um, to, to build that consensus and also to gain those, you know, that other opinion that I referenced, you know, in the opening, it's important to understand the other side because I think, you know, Mike said it really well, it has to be fair and equitable for everyone, right? This is not just the ship, the ship review can't exist without the carrier view. And so I think it's very important that the work we do really creates what is right, not what's beneficial for each of us or our firms, but what's right. And, and I don't know that a lot of organizations see things that way. And I think this group has done a really good job of it. But I think as we drag both sides to the table, uh, the right answers are going to pop out. They always do. It's just really getting everyone around the table to start talking about it. And so I, I thank you all for everything I learned this week. Um, a lot of great insights. And so I think if we keep doing this, eventually change will come. All right. Well, on behalf of the Federal Maritime Commission, um, I know the commission thanks all the members for their service and for all the effort that you put into these discussions and coming to these meetings. Um, and is happy to sort of see these discussions sort of continue on. And it's looking forward to any future recommendations that the committee may push forward. So with that, I will adjourn the meeting. Thank you everyone for attending today. <laughs>